Hello, uh, good evening. A strange story for you. One that I don't really know the answer to it. That's why I'm kind of floating it out there. See if I get any input. Now, I've, I've told this, but I've before. I don't think I've ever told this in full detail. Uh, but I intend to tonight in more detail. Because it implies a few people. I don't think watch this channel. But this is really about um, a prophetic prophecy for me. A voice argument within myself. Um, kind of strange. I don't know who it was. That foretold my future very well. And uh, of hardships to come. And um, I don't know who it was. And I don't hear voices all the time, thank God. There have been a few times in my life I've heard what I believe to be God. I've told those stories, and they always were true, or I believe to be um, the spirits of dear ones of mine that have passed on, who gave me words of encouragement. Uh, but in one, the first one with Brian, when I was 17, um, it kind of plays into this one that happened when I was just about 40. Uh, because he told me the same thing when I was 17 of things that happened in my life that were going to be difficult. And uh, I didn't really think about that a whole lot through my life, honestly, until I made this channel. I started reflecting back at things. And uh, so, skip forward from age 17 to about 40. And I was, it was, a sun, it was a sunny summer day. I was outside with my mom. And there was a uh, young teenage woman that uh, we knew very well. And I'm gonna be, I've got to be careful not to give her identity out. Anybody that watches this video that knows me personally will know who I'm talking about. And if it offends anybody, let me know. I will take it down. I'll probably take this down shortly after I make it anyway. But I wanted to get this off my chest because I've wrestled with who was that voice. And they were so right. So back to about when I was about 40 years old. Um, let me tell you where I was in life because this, this uh, plays along with things. Um, I'll just tell you all of it, really. I had, so I had some hard times financially and done some injustices pretty badly. Um, that's good tea. At the, when this happened, I was finishing up my Master's in Arts to teach English at uh, SUNY at State University in New York. I was going to full, college full-time and... Uh, more or less a single parent father at the time, but my children were just about grown because I had my uh, kids quite young. And um, they were pretty much grown, but I was paying child support, quite a bit of it. And I had my own, an, another child I was taking care of myself, and nobody was helping me in any way with, with this. It's really, that's another story. I don't want to get into it, but I really got done pretty wrong by some people and the state. Um, so I had some financial difficulties, but things were looking up for me in a number of ways because I only had like another year or two left at the Master's in Arts to teach English. So I'd be a, a fully qualified high school English teacher in New York State. I could write my job ticket to teach anywhere in the United States with, a, with that kind of degree from SUNY, State University of New York. It's a good, de good degree, a working man's degree, you know, um, be a high school teacher. And I probably could have taught anywhere in the world, almost, really. And at the same time, I was also um, in the New York Army National Guard. Now, I was active to the Army for 14 years before this. And I saw my plan, my future. I said, well, what am I going to do? I'm going to retire I was active to the Army. I'm going to retire as an enlisted 
infantry sergeant uh, at age 40, 41. What am I going to do? I'll be too young to really be retired. But be having just infantry, you know, military enlisted, um, granted, I was very highly trained and things that look great on a resume. If you like one job, uh, employer said, yeah, this, your resume looks great. If I need a hit, man, I'll give you a call. I had stuff on there like machine gunner, sniper, uh, all kinds of stuff. You know, things that look on your, a military, but for a civilian resume, no. I'm sorry, they can tell you that you're good, you're good for employment, but not anything white collar uh, with military background. It does help you in some ways, but... So I decided, I said, I'll get out at that year, 14 years active duty, go to college full time. You know, as a single dad, it's going to be rough, but I'll go to college full time. I'll work uh, part time jobs and I'll serve out my remaining six years of my 20 years in the Army to retire. I'll finish those six in the, in the National Guard. And that'll also be some income, but that way I'll get my 20 years in. But I'll have to wait till I turn 60 to start drawing it. If I would have finished it in active duty and just did my full 20 regular active duty, I would have uh, been able to draw my pension at 41. But I said, no, get out at 41. I mean, get out, I was like 33, 34, something like that. I guess 34, 35. Go in the uh, New York Army National Guard and spend those six years being a part-timer in the Guard. And I was. I was a tank platoon sergeant and um, a senior leader in that regard. And take those six years and go to college full-time and earn, learn a whole new career. And uh, so originally I wanted to be a medical doctor, honestly. I wanted to help people. You know, I spent all these years training to kill in combat, and I'm really a pacifist. And I just thank God I never had to do any of that, for real. I, I did a lot of things, but I never had to kill anybody. You know, that's another story. But I wanted to do something to help people out, to be a doctor. Well, lo and behold, I'm not ashamed to admit, because I gave it my best, uh, I couldn't make the grade to get into medical school because I am weak. Math is like an Achilles tendon for me. Um, I couldn't get through upper level college uh, physics. Having been out of high school for so long, I couldn't get through the upper level physics, the upper level uh, chemistry. I couldn't get through the math in that. Uh, I found it all interesting, but I just couldn't do the math, and I tried. And, you know, being practical, I thought, well, I I got to do something. So I changed my major to become an English teacher because I'm pretty good. I love to read and write. And um, I'm a good, I was a good trainer and a good teacher because I was a training sergeant in uh, the Army. So I figured that's a, that's a natural, and it was. It was very easy, and I enjoyed, I enjoyed it, uh, the curriculum to be an English teacher. A lot of Shakespeare, a lot of psychology, actually, to be a teacher in New York State. This is all leading up to something. So, you know, and I was a single father and I worked in the mornings as a janitor at the college. I worked at the weekends as a security guard, unless I was uh, in the army uniform on a, on a weekend with my guard unit, um, being a, a platoon sergeant in a tank company, which I enjoyed very much. It was a really great group of soldiers. So I was very busy, and yet I was paying child support, which I paid it all off. I, I had no choice. I, I, this isn't a black mark on me. I didn't want my family to break up. It takes two, and uh, it wasn't. That's another story. But I, before God, didn't do anything that I can think of that was wrong in this. Uh, you know, so that's the way it goes. So I wound up and I fought custody for custody of my children with a lawyer who showed up hungover on the day of my court and didn't even know what he was doing. I lost. I lost. And the state 
of New York said, I not my name, but he said, the state of New York generally favors the mother in these, and just because of my gender, I lost custody of my children. And uh, so that's the way that goes. And I probably won't leave this video up too long, but I want to tell the whole thing. And I'll just unlist it after a few days, or unless somebody angry in my family says something, you know, it's possible. I'm kind of sticking my neck out a bit with this. I'll do it anyway. If somebody has a problem with this, let me know. So I was paying a lot of child support. I was a single dad, getting no support from anyone. I wasn't drawing any social services. I was paying like 40% of my incomes, income and support. And, uh, and I didn't begrudge that either. Um, I was working as a janitor at the college in the morning. And on the weekends and some nights I was working as a security guard at a lumber mill and some other places, which was a great job for a college student because I could sit there in the late at night and do my college work, quite a bit of it. And my son was a latchkey child because I wasn't around a lot, I admit it, and that was difficult. I didn't have a girlfriend or anybody living with me. And um, sometimes I didn't even have a car. I had to walk to work, walk to the college. But I was in shape. I swear I could have walked 30 miles and thought nothing of it. So everything was working out. I was pressing forward with my plans. Now we get to what I wanted to talk about. I was towards the last semester of my student, my master's in arts to teach. I got my bachelor's degree already in English. Can't do much for that. That and a quarter will get you an order of fries. Um, that, that, that's not true. Some... Uh, back BA in English can actually land you some work. But I needed a BA in English to be an English teacher, and you need a master's degree to teach in a public school in New York State. So I'm working on my master's in arts to teach high school English. I was in my final year, and only one more year, it's easy street. Student teaching, I thought, I thought it was easy. I was a natural when it comes to teaching. And all of the, my curriculum, I enjoyed my teachers uh, for the most part. I enjoyed the subjects, uh, English, uh, reading up restoration drama and Shakespeare and romantic era literature and a lot of psycho you know, adolescent psychology, things like that. I found it very interesting. And uh, just kind of enjoying life, believe it or not, working very hard and poor as can be. I mean, we're lucky. If I had ramen noodles, a stick of butter, some sliced cheese, and some corn to mix in with the ramen noodles, we were doing good. I mean, I was really in poverty, my son and I, and uh, the state of New York was garnishing my check so heavily. I recall one time I told my son um, I was working real hard. I had a new job, the janitor job at the college, and I didn't mind that. I wasn't proud. I'll push a mop, scrub, clean toilets, do trash cans, whatever, you know? It's a job. And uh, I said, I'm going to get a paycheck, and you can have anything you want at McDonald's, and we'll go to the store, and you can buy yourself some new clothes and some new shoes. And we're really looking forward to it. And payday come along, and New York State, Jefferson County, Department of Social Services, I'll name them out. Um, I made a boo-boo. I wound up getting a $12 paycheck. They garnished me for like 90% and then taxed it, you know, because then there was taxes. I wound up like $12. And I had to tell my son that we couldn't do all this stuff. And I called him up on the phone to say, hey, what's going on? They said they made a mistake. Well, are you going to refund me that? No. That's the kind of stuff I had to live with. But, you know, the light was at the end of the tunnel because I was going to be a high school teacher. And I was almost done with my Army career at this point. Things were going along well. I was doing well in my Army unit, uh, guard unit. And uh, don't, that, that's a, being a tank platoon sergeant, so M1 tanks at that, that's a pretty big job. Be a weekend warrior or not, that, that's a big job, honestly. I did a lot of things in the National Guard that I didn't do in the active duty. 
So I'm not slighting them at all. They're, most of the soldiers I served with were off regular army. They were really good tankers and soldiers and very, very into their dedicated. And I'm digressing, but I'm just kind of blabbing about where I was at that point in life. And um, I got a picture of me. This time, my friend took it. I was a security guard. Hold on a second. Kind of a silly picture with a cowboy hat. Younger me. And a guy I was working with, as a, he was into photography. And we were working together late at nights at the lumber mill security guard, Tim Myers. Hello. And uh, he's still friends with me. Uh, he lives on the other side of the country now. And he saw the cowboy hat in the back of my um, car. And he thought it would be interesting to take some pictures with me with a cowboy hat and uh, this backdrop. So this is me about the time that I'm talking about. Put it in perspective. I'm a better looking man now. But I didn't know where I was going. Well, I know where I'm going with this. Um, so I was working hard, paying my taxes, not getting any support from anyone. Uh, my son and I were living under poverty level, working poor. I thank New York State for that. There was, you know, but in another year, I was going to be an English teacher making real money. Uh, better than money that I was making being a janitor, that's for sure. New York State... High school teachers are pretty well paid. And uh, my military career was almost successfully finished with 20 years coming up. And um, I would be paid off on the, uh, my child support was just about paid off at that point. My kids were getting older. Like I said, I had them young and they were all coming off. Uh, and I never got any help with the one that I was raising. But I never really looked for it either. And um, I didn't take any social services, no food stamps, none of that stuff, no welfare. Nope. So, and all my tax returns, I always had earned income, you know, credit for my tax returns. Oh, four or $5,000 back then. That's like eight or $9,000 today. It's good money. I never saw a single penny of it. New York State took all of that as well. So it was pretty frustrating times, but I was getting by all right. And I knew that I would come out on top. You can't hold a good man down, right? So I kept my nose to the grindstone and uh, one more year and I'd be done with my master's in arts to teach and I'd be done with my 20 years in the army. And that was kind of money in the bank when I turned 60. I started drawing army pension with full medical benefits. And I started drawing that re not too long ago. Well, all right, here's where the story comes in. The prophetic voice, the argument, discussion within myself, but it wasn't me. All right, this is odd. This is why I can't figure it out to this day. So I was with my mother and enjoying it. It was a summer day, right not far from where I'm sitting in my town. And my mother was with a young teenage girl that... Uh, she knew very well. I won't say names or the relationship. But um, I knew this person to be a dishonest person. But that's besides the point at this point. But my mother really loved her and probably still does quite a lot. I think she was the daughter that she never had. I always thought, you know. And I'm just standing there, smiling. We were outdoors, and it was summertime. And I watched my mom with this young woman. There were just the three of us. I think it was in her backyard. And my mother and her were laughing. And my mother, they were really laughing from her, my mother from her heart. And uh, she was looking at this young woman, you know, probably about 15, 16 years old. And my mother was just 
this, this young woman was a joy to my mother. And my mother was laughing, and I'm watching, I'm not saying anything, and here's where it comes. A voice, like my thoughts in my head, I didn't hear it with my ears. I'm watching, and a voice says, oh no. And I go, what? I answered it. Very few times do I have a conversation within myself. And when I do, the few times I have, you better believe that other voice is knows the future. Um, I don't hear voices like a schizo. They don't tell me what to do. They prophesize or they give me words of encouragement. Be my mother, you know, like God's spirit or people I've known that have passed on. And I've told those stories. This one, I don't know who it was. It was a male voice, sounded like myself, but it wasn't. It wasn't me. So here's how the discussion went in my head. Voice one, unknown, and I'll be me, or I'll just call it voice one. Voice one, oh no. And I felt an instant sinking, like sinking. Even though I was happy, like and my mom and this other young woman are right in front of me looking at each other laughing. There were some kind of funny discussion they were having together. And I'm watching it about from me to the camera. And I said, what? And the voice said, this is going to be a very bad, protracted, and I remember the word protracted, protracted, bad time for you. And I knew, something within me knew that what it was saying was like written in stone. It was going to happen. And I said, no, it won't. I argued with it. Because I only had a year and I was going to be a fully qualified English teacher. This wasn't what I was saying to it. But I was thinking, in one more year, I'm going to have my master's in arts to teach English. And I can write my own job ticket anywhere. I'm not stuck here in this town with whatever's going on between my mother and this young woman. So I said, no, it won't. I said, I'll just, if it gets too tough, I'll just move away. And this is what the other voice said. No, you won't be able to. He said, you're going to be tied up into this thing in a way that you won't be able to get out of it. And it's going to be a very long, protracted bad time for you and that was it and I'm just left and that was it. it whatever that presence was that told me that left at that point and I'm just standing there like all the hard work I'd done to get through the hard times to get through paying out the yin yang, they can't even garnish that much now. But back in the 90s and around 2000, they could clean you out for support in this state. And it didn't matter if you were a single dad. Nothing mattered. Just with the state of New York, money comes first, collecting it. And um, so, for the sake of redundancy, I'm going to repeat the conversation without interjections, all right? When I go like this, that means that's the voice that I heard. I'm watching my mother right in front of me, about far from the camera, and she's looking at this young woman, and they are joking, and they have a conversation going that's got my mother just laughing in joy, delighted. The voice says, oh, no. What? This is going to be a very long, bad time for you. It says, I say, no, it won't. And then I sensed that it was, I guess I am interjecting, because I sensed that it, it was, like I said, I knew what it was saying was really bad news. And I picked up what it was trying to convey to me that I was in for a really bad time, 
with these two in front of me. And it was going to be a long, long time, a very big hardship in my life. So I argued with it. I said, no, it won't. I, I'll just move away from it. If, if it gets too tough for me, I'll move away. I'll just move away. And I could do that with a master's in arts to teach. Just go somewhere else. I didn't plan to teach in this town anyway. I planned to go. I wanted to teach up in the Adirondacks or the Catskills. You know, well, how's this thing going to affect me? I've got it made. And it's answered me, no, you won't be able to get out of it. You're going to be tied up in this in a way that you will not be able to get out of it. And it's going to be a very long, protracted, bad time for you. And then it left, and I'm just deflated. I mean... I'm looking at these two still laughing. My mother's absolutely enamored, enslaved with this person who was a very manipulative young woman who owned my mother. And I knew, I knew that it was like written in stone. I didn't, I didn't know how this was going to happen. It didn't seem possible because I'm a free man. It, I'm not stuck here. I, you know, I could just move away, you know what I mean? I don't, my kids are pretty much grown at this point. The one that's with me, he's almost out of the house. I'll just move away. You know, I, I don't, I'm not even part of this. I didn't plan to even live in this town. But it said I wouldn't be able to get out of it. It said I would be tied up in a way that I wouldn't be able to get out of it. Who was this? Because you know what happened the next year? Right when I was finishing my Master's in Arts to Teach, in my final year, in my 20 years in the military. So I'm going to be a high school English teacher, and I've got 20 years in the military, 14 active, 6 guard, also for a pension. And when I'm the age I am now, I'll have a New York State teacher's pension, a U.S. Army full pension, plus Social Security. I'll be doing pretty well. That was my plan. Well, lo and behold, my final semester of student teaching. I don't know, about six months to a year after this voice incident, the terrorist hit the World Trade Center on my final semester. And I wind up getting ordered to active duty by New York State Governor. I wind up going to the, the World Trade Center with my guard unit. I'm right in the thick of the stuff. For 16 days, uh, we were first responders. It was still a rescue mission when we first got there. We didn't find anybody. They found a cat alive. I made a story about that, my World Trade Center experiences. But that shot down my semester. I came back from that in New York State. SUNY State University of New York told me, um, you... You've been absent. You, you need to formally withdraw from class and just redo it next semester, the spring of 2002, student teaching. Because I was student teaching high school when this happened. All right, I can do that. It's a setback, but, you know, I answered the call to duty, and these things happen. So no problem. So I redid the thing the next semester, spring of 2002, Finished everything for my high school, you know, my master's in arts to teach English in New York State High School. I'm ready to hit the job market, get on with my life, my new career. Finish up, uh, my child support was almost paid off. I only had less than a year left to get my 20 in the Army. I'm looking at, finally, some smooth sailing, hopefully. You know, in charge of my destiny. And I'm going to hit the job market and start looking for teaching jobs. In the Adirondacks or somewhere nice. In, uh, it's nice right here, but I, I want to move on and be on my own. Well, I went to graduate the spring of 2002, and SUNY Cortland said they wouldn't let me graduate. There was a problem. SUNY said that I, they put an academic freeze on my account because I was absent from classes the, the previous semester when I got called to duty by the New York State governor, 
ordered to duty by the New York State governor to help out at the World Trade Center, and I did what I was told to do. Well, they said I was absent from class, and because of that, a portion of my student loan for that semester, $3,463, defaulted. And until I paid SUNY back that money, they weren't going to let me graduate. I felt I'd been stabbed in the back, and I had, by the state of New York. I was pretty angry, and um, I was real angry. I didn't have $3,400 either. I explained to them, when you're student teaching, as I was, you can't moonlight. You know, the only thing I had going on was my New York Army National Guard on the weekends, and that paid pretty good money, but they were taking that for child support and, and for anything else I had, you know, and... Uh, so I didn't have it, but New York State wouldn't budge. And I was really angry. And um, I didn't know anybody that had that kind of money. And I couldn't borrow it. And I really didn't feel that I owed it to them. I said, look, just, I, I, ordered, I answered the call to duty. State University of New York, my college. I said, you're New York. I went to help New York out in its darkest hour at 9-11. I said, now let me graduate and get a job teaching and get on with my life. I'm working doing my job and you're getting paid and we're all happy and you did the right thing too. They wouldn't, they wouldn't budge. And I was incensed, incensed, and I still am, if you can't tell. And uh, I got some senators that were on my side and I got the VA that backed me up and they went to Albany and fought for me and lost. And the VA was told to leave it alone. But so meanwhile, I'm not working. I'm working factory jobs, you know, because they, New York State wouldn't free up my teaching degree. And you can't really say you're certified until you get that stamp, you know, on it. And um, I know it's just, sorry, I don't know why. But um, so I couldn't teach. And I'm fighting to get them to do the right thing, but they weren't budging. And I, so I'm back to working factory jobs and still paying support, a lot of it, so I didn't have any money. And it turned out that I wound up, I couldn't make a living. Um, so I paid off my child support shortly thereafter, and I did finish, actually here's the other thing. A teacher, a principal, that, that semester, the summer of 2002, in Cortland, at, well, at my, a small city nearby, he said, he called me on the phone, he said, I've heard good things about you as a person. And he said, I heard what they did to you, um, and it wasn't right. And he says, I have a, a high school English teacher uh, position open in the fall. And this was around June of 2002. So the fall of 2002... He said, I want to interview you for that job. And he said, we'll work around that garbage with the college. You know, that. don't worry about it. I'm like, oh, thank God. I said, all right, I was going to see him the next week. But I'm still in the guard. I wasn't quite out yet. And next thing you know, the state, they ordered us back to active duty before I could interview. And I'm supposed to go away this time, maybe to the Middle East for peacekeeping or I forgot what they called it. My unit was mobilized for homeland defense because New York didn't know if we were going to get hit again. You know, nobody knew what, what terrorists were going to do next. So they were mobilized for a full year, which honestly, at my rank and time in service, I would have made very, very good money during that mobilization. And I didn't have any choice. I had to go because I, I still had about seven months left in. And they would have extended it, so I could have done the year, then let me out, and retire then. So I had to call that, that high school principal up and say, I'm sorry, I can't make it. My unit has been mobilized. And he was frustrated. Isn't there anything you can do? No, I'm a senior, lead, I'm a senior leader in my unit. I can't just leave. You know, I couldn't. I got to go. And I want, actually wanted to go um, with my unit. I, I really wanted to go. And serve with them. But then I wound up 20 years in the Army as a paratrooper, machine gunner, tank commander, infantry sergeant, 
all kinds of hardcore jobs. I got taken out by a flower vase. I had this, uh, at home, I had this really heavy glass large flower vase that fell and broke. And it was probably three pounds, just what was left of it, and really sharp spear point like, I thought, God, somebody get hurt with this. Until I find a box to put it in to throw it out, I put it on top of my fridge just to get it out. It looked dangerous with big, thick spear points on it, heavy. Well, I had some groceries. It was summertime, like I said, and in my arms at night. And I came in, and they were in my arms, and I wanted to open the freezer door and put the stuff in the freezer. And when I did that, that vase fell, and it fell right into the top of my foot. And I had sandals on and shorts. And that thing went right through the top of my foot, probably cut tendons. I couldn't walk right for almost a year. Oh, I put a pressure dressing on it and went right to the hospital and they sewed it up and it got infected and the foot swelled up. It was really painful for about three months. So I went to get mobilized the next week and the army doctor uh, said, you're not going anywhere. It was like two weeks later, you know, I went to mobilization and I'm like on crutches, really needed to be in a wheelchair. I I couldn't even, I couldn't stand on the leg at all, let alone walk. And he told me, you're not going anywhere with that. So there went my opportunity to make, I figured I would earn sixty or $70,000 easily on that mobilization, and I could pay off everything. And then I could get on with my life as a high school teach, English teacher with a good pile of cash, too. Nope, that was gone now. And uh, I called that principal up real quick and told him this like two weeks later what happened. That I'm released from military active duty now because of my injury. And um, he said, it's too late. He already hired someone. So that left me sitting on my own in a wheelchair, really, and crutches in my house alone. My son moved out about this time, unemployed, still getting a little guard check, but then I retired out, so I didn't get that any. Pretty much broke. Um, can't teach, because the college has that froze up. Didn't get to go on the mobilization because of that flower vase that went right through the top of my foot, and I, I couldn't walk that was the I can't run still couldn't run it did some serious damage so it wasn't like I this isn't what I wanted I wanted to go I was bummed out about that and I retired out my unit went off to duty and I got left behind and they just let me retire out with my 20 so now I'm out of the guard I'm out of the military I finished my sixth my plan to get my masters in arts to teach but I can't use it because of that injustice the college did, and I didn't have any money to pay them. Even if I wanted, I thought it was wrong. Even if I wanted to pay them, I didn't have it. And I couldn't walk, I had no way to make money. So my mother had a business, I wound up working for my mother's business. This is where I'm tied up into things where I can't get out. And meanwhile, this young woman winds up having babies, and the guys that she's Having kids with, this is where it could get in trouble with people. I hope not. They're not supporting these kids. Good-hearted people, but nobody's taking care of the children. My mother's paying for everything. And then people got involved with drugs. And they got her. They started taking her money and cleaning her out. And I'm working for her business because that's the only job I could do. And then I got out of that, and I actually got another job. Once I could walk, I started working at other places. But they weren't leaving me anything to live on. And uh, meanwhile, I'm watching my mother getting completely ripped off, cleaned out, lied to, taken advantage of. And she loves these people so much. And she just wanted to bring them all to the Lord. And she figured that they, 
when she gave them money for their drugs or whatever they needed, children's clothes, diapers, cigarettes, drugs, rent money, everything. And my mother had a business, a very good business with a good reputation. And they cleaned her out and kept cleaning her out. And that, being the per type of person I am, drove me nuts. It was hell. Seven days a week, I'm caught between this group of grand, these hustlers, these liars, these deadbeat parents that didn't even take care of their kids. They ultimately gave their kids up for adoption. And drug addicts that my mother was trying to bring to Christ. And they knew that. So they were playing it and laughing at her behind her back. Can you imagine my love of the Lord and my love of my mother and my love of truth and watching this happen? And my mother didn't want me involved. She, she became, I think, addicted to the role of enabler. There were other people that were, nobody in my family was, they didn't live around here. It was just me. I'm stuck here. I couldn't teach. I couldn't, I wound up, I couldn't use my teaching career. I thought I'd be able to move away from the mess. I couldn't. I couldn't use my teaching uh, degree. So I'm working factory jobs and they're taking, still taking 40% of my income. And it's tough, it's tough times and, uh, for me. And I wound up paying off, finally all my child sports paid off, every penny of it. And I could I didn't want to get out of it. I never begrudged paying my sport. Paid every penny of it off. Then in Jefferson County, the, the hearing examiner, guy named McDaniels, he says to me, and he put a bailiff standing right by me, so close I could feel the heat off his beer gut, because the judge McDaniels, no longer around, I don't care if he did hear this, um, he probably expected I was going to try to choke him at this point. He said, congratulations, me. He says, you paid off all your support. My kids are grown. They're out on their own. And I paid off all the support, all the rears. Ah, right? Finally, a breath of air. After all the suppression of living in sub-poverty. And then he says, now, with a grin on his face, you get to pay this off. And she was on social services through those years. $98,000 he gave me to pay off. Right as soon as my support was done, I had to pay New York State off $98,000 for social services bills. And he said, you can't get out of this. He told me, you can get a lawyer. He says, I can tell you right now, save your money. It's written right in the New York State laws that when you owe this money to social services for somebody's welfare bills that walked out on their marriage and went on welfare, um, I'll probably enlist this after I post it shortly after. Um, they said, you can't get out of it. You, there, you can't. It's written right into state law. $98,000. So, no, I'm tied down for a long time. And I wound up having to work for my mother for her business. And I don't care if it sounds good or bad, but at least working for my mother and her business, I could um, get paid on the books, which would pay on my arrears. I had to pay on them. Or they'll throw me in jail. Uh, they take your driver's license. They'll do all they, I didn't have any passport privileges this whole time. I just recently got my passport back. The state of New York wouldn't let me have a passport until recently. Until I paid that $98,000 off. No passport. You know, I was a, like a third class citizen. Like a slave. I can't, I'm not going anywhere. So I worked for my mother's business. Paid on the books, paid the money that I had to pay to New York State, I had to. And then I got paid under the table some money, and I had to, because I couldn't even afford a car. I was so broke working with what they were taking. They were taking child support, New York State taxes, they weren't leaving me with anything. I remember I had a good job working at a salt mine. 
It paid pretty well. Hard work, but it paid well. I put it 60 hours a week. I think I was going to get well over $1,000. New York State was leaving me with $198 a week to live off of. That's how much they were taking from me after I paid my support off. You can imagine the frustration I was in. And poor Jen was with me during these years, some of them. And this frustration of this was, it bled into my life, my personal life. I think it, a lot of things it had quite an impact on me. But at the same time, indeed, like that voice said, oh no, so forth, you're going to be tied up in this in a way that you won't be able to get out of it. And I couldn't leave town. I was stuck working for my mother's business. It's the only way I could make enough money to at least have the basic things in life. I was living in a trailer, driving an old car, and glad to have them. You better believe it. Enjoying life, but not enjoying life because I'm dealing with the injustice of what the state had done to my teaching career. And I finally got New York State in a federal court, um, me versus New York State. And I was trying to sue New York State in a federal court. I had my day in a federal court for breach of contract. I finished my degree. I did everything I was required of me as a student and a soldier in their guard. And they turned around and did what they did to my career. That's a breach of contract. I represented myself in, in court. Albany sent their team of big shot lawyers and they took, they took me apart, character assassination. They totally ignored, completely ignored the fact that I was ordered to active duty, which made all this happen. They ignored that. They made me look like somebody that skipped out on my obligations, like an errant teenager at spring break and just skipped out of college. You know, and took the semester off and spent the money. I am not exaggerating. That's New York State for you, they're, and they're still that way. They, they don't have any dignity at all. Um, I'm still upset about it. So yeah, they took me apart, character assassination. So I lost that. Oh well, so much for that. Hmm. And so I'm stuck working for my mother and her business. And these people, this group of young people, this young woman that she's enthralled with completely. I don't know what happened there. Hmm. Whoa, whoa, whoa. They're still taking my mother. Now they're hooked on some heavy drugs, heavier drugs. And there's more people hooked on drugs involved. Whoa, my candle's failing me now. Some reason. I'm making a mess. Sorry. And they were cleaning my mother out and her business out that I was still working for because it's the only way I could make enough money to get by and still pay this stuff off. Working, you know, there we go. Um, she was getting cleaned out. Her business was failing. And it was breaking my heart to see this happen to my mother, whom I love so much. And she had such a great business and reputation. And her reputation was failing, too, because people were starting to know that she was buying these people drugs with the money she earned at her business, which was a nursing home. And people loved her because she took wonderful care of people. And... She loved God with all her heart, and she loved people so much. Like the video I made recently about forgive and forget, she's the one that could forgive and forget. She let these people use her because she loved them that much. She told me she wanted to bring them to Christ. She said it was her mission to save them. And I said, Mom, buying her drugs, I showed her places in the Bible. You're not supposed to deadbeat parents. You're not supposed to support them. But she was stuck with this group. They were very, very manipulative, very dishonest. They cleaned her out. And they wanted me out of the way. Because I was doing everything within my power to stop them from what they were doing. 
to my mother and her business. And they, there was more of them than me. And nobody was helping me. I had some people sympathetic to me, but they're like, ah, I'm not getting involved in this. And my family, the rest of them are far away. So it's just me here with my mother and these vultures, deadbeat parents, dishonest people, cleaning my mother out, taking her love of Christ for a ride. And you know, I think she did bring them to Christ, and uh, I'll talk about that. But I was stuck in this, and the stress from my finances and what the state did to me, sticking me with the welfare bills of this person after I paid all support. $100,000, really. $98,000 and change. And other things they'd done to me. Took my passport. You know, my daughter got married in England, and I couldn't even go attend that. And you know how embarrassing that was? So it's bled into my relationship, and it didn't help my relationship out with the one I love, Jen, so much. And I was so stressed out, I don't know how I even survived it. The stress was, it was hell. Seven days a week, 365 days a year, and it went on for almost 20 years. And it, I always kept thinking, next year will be better. And it just got progressively worse with these people until my mother lost her business, wound up losing her home, and they were still stealing her stuff, unless it was literally tied down, chained down. I had to chain down her new snowblower so they didn't steal it, uh, no, her lawnmower, because they stole her snowblower. And then my mother lost her business, her reputation. The family was ripped to shreds because of the turmoil that this caused. And these people tried to portray me as a bad person to the rest of the family that wasn't in the area. They're watching this from afar, shaking their heads. And this group of people around here that were with this group of dishonest people spun me as a really bad person because they wanted me out of the picture because I was trying to stop their feed bag, you know, their free ticket. I'm sorry, I'm still upset about it. So it was definitely a very bad time, a very bad time. And I told you, I want you to back up because there's, it's a, there's a ray of sunshine in this and a lesson for everybody in this. Now this young woman was, my mother lost her home. She lost her business. She lost her reputation. Our family was torn to shreds and they still are by the problems this caused. It was a tremendous hardship on my life, beyond words. And um, it hurt me financially. It hurt my sense of justice. It hurt me to see my mother go through this. And I had to pick her up at her house the day the police came and physically evicted her in her wheelchair from her house. And these people were there on that day, and they stole her purse, her checkbook, they stole her computer. They stole anything they could the day she was evicted. And I took my mom away in the car, and that was a, that was a low, a hard day for me. And my mother just tried to stay positive. It's all going to work out. She had faith in God. She wound up going to a nursing home, a low-rent one. I couldn't take her in my house, or I would have, to take care of her because she needed help at this point in her life. She was in her mid-80s. And uh, my, I have concrete stairs. There's no way you're going to get her up those stairs and narrow in her wheelchair unless I had somebody to help me. I had nobody to help me. She went to this nursing home where she caught COVID and she died. And at that time, actually, when my mother lost her business, this group of vultures, they all packed up and they left town. They moved to some other town. And... Well, oh, yeah, let me wrap this up. My battery died, so I had to take care of that. So this went on for the better part of 20 years, and I cannot convey to you how much emotional, mental, financial stress this put on me and my life. 
and which bled into my relationships uh, with my mother first because my mother and I were arguing a lot because I was arguing with her to stop giving these people money. In fact, don't let them on your property because what they can't beg or borrow, they're going to steal. And if they borrow it, they're not going to give it back. Um, this is no exaggeration. If they can't beg or borrow it, they're going to steal it. And, uh, but she wouldn't listen to me, and her business is failing. And that was supposed to be my business to take it over. Uh, if it wasn't going to happen, it was failing. I'm arguing with my mother to get her to stop, but she wouldn't stop. She told me that it was her calling, that God had told her to save these people. And this drove me nuts because I'm my way of looking at how are you going to save these people by doing this? You know, and um, so my mom and me were at odds during the last years of her life. Weren't quality years for us, though we loved each other. Not a day came or the sun didn't set, no matter how much her and I butted heads over these people and what they were doing. Um, we still loved each other, and we'd call each other up on the phone and talk to each other gently and say, I love you, and or I'd go over in person and tell her I love you, or she, when she could drive, she'd come tell them. We always said we love you. So, but um, my relationship, like with Jen, it affected that negatively because I was a stressed-out mess, and we were dirt poor. The only entertainment her and I had were uh, music and beer and each other and nature. And uh, we went to church some, um, yes, but we were pretty poor people financially because of everything I've told you with the state, the SUNY, the government, the governor, the, the court system. There's a lot of injustice upon me, and it hurt. And then the stress of what my mom was going through with doing, and ultimately she lost her business, she lost her home, she lost all her possessions except her wheelchair and the clothes on her back. Those people even took her purse. Those people that took advantage of her Christian love just so they could take everything she had, a group of people. And I had to witness it. And the rest of my family wasn't there to see it. And they were believing what these other people were telling them, that I was somehow the cause of the problems. These people were very, very good liars. I mean, they, they were professional liars. They, they put food on their table with lies. They were professional liars. And they were very good at it. And there was a, more of them than just me. And um, it was a hard time to see all that, that it just kept getting worse. The better part of 20 years. And then it stopped. My mom died of COVID. I wound up getting a settlement, a uh, good lump of money for working these blue collar jobs that I shouldn't be working at my age. And I wound up injuring my shoulder and my hands. And I did the smart thing and got a lawyer and uh, Got a settlement out of it, so the state of New York, of course, took a lot of that. But they were paid off, and that was all done. That was in the past, completely in the past. I still get anxieties when I get a paycheck. You know what it feels like for 20 years to get a pay? When at 25, I paid support for 35 years. I paid all my child support off. Then I had to pay off $98,000 of social services bills. On top of that, you know what it felt like to get a paycheck after working hard for it? And then you look at the deductions and you got nothing left. It was heartless. I still, when I get paid, I have this anxiety attack still. Like, is it all going to be there or am I going to... All these candles. I got to wrap this up. So I went through a very hard time. Um, like the voice said, go back to the beginning of this video. When I looked at this person when they were a teenager and my mom together, and I'm like, 
And the voice says, oh no. I go, what? This is going to be a very, very bad time for you. And I said, no, it won't. I'll just move away if it gets rough. Because I got the image that it was going to be a really hard time here with them. And the voice said, no, you're going to be tied up in this in a way that you won't be able to get out of it. It's going to be a very long, bad, and then protracted, as in drawn out, and it was, bad time for you. And so this was true. Who was this? I don't know. I don't know who it was. I'd like to go back to when I was 17 and uh, Brian Hunt, when he took me up into heaven, my friend who was killed, and I wound up, I made videos on that, um, where my friend, when I was 17, uh, he told me, and he was very sad for me, and he said, he spoke to me at length when we were walking through paradise together. He's in a white robe and we're going through paradise down a path. And he said, your mother's going to be doing things later in my life. She's going to be doing things that you're not going to understand at the time. He told me this. He said, she's going to be doing things later in your life that you're not going to understand at the time. What happened later in my life? And he says, stop walking. He said, I just want you to remember, Tim, it's all going to work out for you in the end. He says, remember that. It's going to work out for you in the end. So God had a plan for this. And my mother, too. I saw her in heaven. She made it. This was all in God's plan. And these people got off drugs. I've heard, I've heard they're, they're cleaned up. This was all part of God's plan. I couldn't see it at the time, uh, but it was all part of God's plan, all of it. <sighs> there was something else. Oh, there was something else. Oh, go back to when I was 11 or 12, when I had a choice between paths. And I told that story where God actually spoke to me in my life and came to me and said, I'm very pleased with you. That's another story. If you want to know, it is post posted. It's one of my original earlier stories years ago. It's called A Choice Between Two Paths. A rare visit with God. And he told me, he offered me a path. With, I was going to be a celebrity of some sort and have the love of my life and, and beautiful children and a good health and fame and a sterling reputation and a great love in my life, and me and my woman would have a long life together and a good love, and relatively few medical problems, the usual things people have, but relatively good health, and a long life together, you know, and all the things, and he said, there are good things in this world, it's not all bad. Um, this was when I was 11 or 12, and that my integrity would be... Um, unquestionable. He said from coast to coast. So I'd be known. Why? Well, I don't know what. I was going to be a sports star. Or, I have no idea. Um, but then he offered me the other path, which I chose, which he, in the first one, I got to actually see myself and my wife and children in front of this beautiful house by the ocean, like up from the sky. And uh, this path, the second path, I didn't get to see me. It was like I got a darkness, an image. But I sensed who I am at this point in my life. I sensed that I would be alone and very bitter. And God let me sense that. And he said, uh, it's harder, he said. He said, but there are more opportunities for learning in this one than the first path. And I thought, well, I'm going to please God. I'll take that path because I wanted to please him when you're in his presence. And he said, no, don't be so quick. Think about it. And I, ouch, because to hear him talk that way, to be in his presence. And I thought, well, I sensed that I was going to be a very bitter, angry 
person alone. And I said to the Lord, I said, what if my bitterness makes me turn from you? And then, of course, I've always told this on this channel. I heard God laugh. And he said, nothing could have. I said, what if it makes me turn from you, separates me from you? And he said, nothing could ever separate me from you. He said, nothing. With a laugh, like a good Santa Claus laugh. Nothing could ever separate me from you. And he said, I will, he knew what I was thinking, that I wanted to please God. I wanted to choose a second path. And he was trying to warn me not to. I wasn't going to listen. And he said, um, it doesn't matter which one you choose, the path with, you know, the, all the nice things in life or the harder, lonely path. He said, I will love you just the same. It doesn't matter. He said, regardless, it doesn't matter. I will love you the same because he knew I wanted to. So I should have picked the first one, but I didn't. I said, I'll take the second one. Poof, that was it. Well, the second one, I was supposed to be alone and bitter later in life. And then when I was 17, my friend who was killed in a car accident, about a year after that, Brian Hunt, I got taken up into heaven where he talked to me about my life to come. And he was doing well, I'll say. And uh, he told me that my mother would be doing things later in my life that I wouldn't understand. And he was very concerned for me. And he just kept, he reminded me, it's going to work out for me in the end. And that was the end of that visit. Then when I was about 40, I saw my mother with this person. And my mother was enthralled with this, really enthralled. And then that, oh no. And that wasn't me. Or was it? No, it wasn't. Because I argued with it. What? This is going to be a very bad time for you with these two. I said, no, it won't. I'll just move away from here if it gets tough. I can do that. No, you won't be able to get away. You're going to be tied up in this in a way that you won't be able to get out of it. And it's going to be a very long, drawn out, protracted bad time. Poof. And then that's the end of that. So... I've gone on for, I don't know, over an hour, I think. What's the lesson in this? The lesson is, honestly, God has a plan for us. God, the Bible, right? God, I, it's, he has a, it says that he's got a plan for our lives. Doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be an easy one. It, it was all foretold to me three times in my life that this was going to happen to me. And it took a better part of 20 years. This hardship I was talking about with my mother and these people, it took 20 years to resolve. And I was caught and tied up in it. And you know why. I told you why. I couldn't get out of it. You better believe I wanted to. It was crushing me, but I got through it. it was crushing my relationship. It certainly didn't help it. The stress, I had a lot of stress. Drank, upset all the time. I didn't take it out on anybody. But I, I'm not going to repeat myself. It didn't, it stressed me out with my relationship with my dear mom. It didn't help my relationship with my dear one, Jen, who I just lost both these people. I trust they're in the keeping of the Lord. We'll meet up again. But God had a plan for me that it wasn't necessarily going to be easy, but I got through it. So they know the future. God, God knows if they know the future. So when you're going through the valleys in life, trust God. He has a, he has a plan already written down for you, foretold. I still, but I still don't know, I can't figure out who that was that said, oh no, and told me I was going to go through a really bad time and I wouldn't be able to get out of it. Protracted. What I told you is pretty much verbatim what the inner conversation was between me and the other. And it wasn't myself, because I haven't had that happen very many times. Very, I can count on one hand in my life. How many times this has happened? That's one of them.
So I don't hear voices all. I don't. And I really don't believe I'm mentally ill, but if somebody wants to believe that, I don't care. But some of us, I have some kind of other spiritual qualities, psychic, I wouldn't call it that. I don't know what you'd call it. Loved by God, that's what I am. And I love God back, and I try to stay honest, and I'm, I try to ask for forgiveness, and I don't know what to tell you. God loves me. But it doesn't mean that my life is a walk in the park. Um, I just have to wait on the Lord, have faith in God, wait on the Lord. I have found all these. I've collected the weirdest things. Um, all right, well, that's the story. It's probably the longest one I think I've ever told on here, but I just covered pretty much my lifetime my army career, my what happened, to everything I talked about, how they kept me poor. I feel rich. Just now I'm able to work and save money for the first time in my life. I haven't had money to go visit my kids or grandchildren or a decent car or a decent house. You know, I've lived quite humble, and it's kept me humble. It hasn't been a horrible thing. I mean, thank the Lord my health has held up for the most part. I have a lot to be thankful for, but it was a hard time. I have a strong sense of justice. And uh, I don't like liars, and I don't like injustice. And I, So uh, seeing these things happen to my mother from these people that were just... She was on a mission from God to save them. I don't know what, I don't know what to tell you. It's all in the past now, and that things have worked out because my mother, I saw her in heaven. She died of COVID. I told that story. She's doing very well. She looks great, very happy, and assured me it only has to be this way for now, our separation. And I have reason to believe that Jen, my loved one, Jen, is doing well. And it as far as I know, the, the person I was talking about that was on drugs and doing dishonest things, I think they straightened their life out. That's what I've heard from people that finally straightened their life out, which is good. So my mom helped them out a lot. I know in spite of this person being what they were to my mother, they did love her very much, but I don't know what to tell you. That's it. I don't think I can add any more to this. But take it from me, God has a plan for your life. It may not be what you want. You may be in for a rough ride, or you may not be. But Wait upon the Lord. I did. 20 years. Every year of that hardship, it was a living hell. I, I can't even explain to you how bad it got with these people trying to get rid of me. Everything, trying to defame me, to get me out of the picture, to make me look like I'm crazy. Uh, they, they pulled so many bad stunts on me. Um, and my mom was just, I don't know what to say. I've said it all. All right, well, um, I finally finished some projects. And I hope to get on to my music next, God willing. So, God bless each one of you. And uh, I hope some good came of this. Um, I just want to share this with you. Take care. You're really burning.